Well, good evening, ladies, lasses and lassos. Welcome to the Click You Smell Absolutely Astounding today. And don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. The world really does suck, doesn't it? I feel like every single day I log on, I see some new transphobic account on Twitter spreading some hateful rhetoric. Although, to be fair, sometimes they do get ratioed by trans furries, which is very satisfying to see indeed. Or you see some awful policies being passed about discriminating people, or there's war in the world, you see people getting hurt and targeted. Everything just seems to be constantly on fire, and it is kind of exhausting. So how bad is the world really? Well, I am gonna give you a little quiz because you, yes you sitting there at home, is gonna be my little sample size because we are indeed people of science and you are my specimen. <laughs> that sounds really... Really wholesome. <laughs> Let me tell you how horrible the world is. You're my lab rat. All right, <laughs> let's get into it. So what I want you to do is write out a draft comment for your answers. There are multiple choices. So you can answer like 1A, 2B, 3A, you know, stuff like that. So let's take a look at it together, how all of you answer. I am really interested to see this. Question number one. In specifically all low-income countries in the world, how many girls graduates... Oh no, <laughs> graduate. I, I apparently didn't graduate elementary school. Whoops, ignore that. <laughs> How many girls graduate elementary school in low-income countries? Is it 20%, 40%, or 60%? So write your answer below, 1A, B, or C. Question number two. In the last 20 years, the proportion of people living in extreme poverty has doubled, remained constant, or been cut in half. So which one is it? The extreme poverty in the world, is it doubled, relatively constant, or cut in half? Question number three. What is the global average life expectancy? Is it 50 years, 60 years, or 70 years? Man, I, I still have a couple of good years in me. <laughs> oh yeah. Question number four. How many children globally has received a vaccine at one year old? So out of all the children in the world, how many have received a vaccine by the age of one? Is it 20%, 50% or 80%? And lastly, question number five. Globally, 30 year old men go to school for 10 years on average. But what about 30 year old women? Do 30-year-old women go to school for an average of 9 years, 6 years, or 3 years in comparison to the 30-year-old men that go to school for 10 years? Is it 9, 6, or 3? Leave your answers in the comments below. And we'll see you in the episode next week about the answer. No, I'm kidding. It's right now. It's right now. Let's get into the answer, shall we? Question number one. The right answer is C. 60% of girls graduate elementary school in low-income countries. For question number two, the correct answer is C. The population living in extreme poverty has halved over the last 20 years. Question number three. The correct answer is C. The global life expectancy is 70 years. Which, damn, that's high. I still got a couple of good years in me. Hell yeah. Question number four. Correct answer is C. How many children globally has received a vaccine at one years old, which is 80%? My God, that's a high number. Question number five. The correct answer is A. 30-year-old men on average go to school for 10 years and women go to school for 9 years. Still a discrepancy, but I thought it was going to be way worse. So if I were to guess, you sitting there at home with your little pre-typed comment and stuff, hopefully didn't cheat and Google anything, probably got all the answers wrong. Or at least maybe 4 out of 5 wrong. And that is to be perfectly expected. The first time I did this quiz with the full 12 questions, which is the full quiz, I think I got... 3 out of 12 answers correct. I consider myself a relatively well-educated individual. I have my fancy degrees from university, I've worked in management and that kind of stuff, I run my little investment portfolios, I have my own company here with my YouTube shenanigans. I got 3 out of 12 right. I can't remember the last time I scored that low on a test. So why do we score so low? on these questions, in these tests, even when you think like, I'm pretty well read up on the world, etc, etc. And it is due to how information is presented to us and how we absorb it. This is taken from a book called uh, Factfulness by Hans Rusling. Mine is in Swedish, but you, it's translated in many different languages. I'm not sponsored, I just think it's an amazing book. And the whole book starts off with 12 questions. Uh, these five are examples from that. And the whole point is that we have a very skewed perspective of the world. And the book goes into a few different subjects, but one of the subjects is the fallacy of how we absorb information. For example, one of the fallacies is that the stuff you see in news, or especially on social media nowadays, is always the extreme. If you see a news story, it's either the most tragic or the most fascinating or the most 
extreme and our brains kind of average this out and think that this is how the world looks, at least emotionally and subconsciously. This is kind of similar to like, you know, what Instagram does. It gives us a very skewed perspective of what an average body looks like. But if you go to the beach, most people don't have a six pack. And this is a very similar phenomenon. It also goes into other fallacies, for example, how a small dip in a certain progress can feel very bad and like the world is kind of ending. But if you zoom out on a larger perspective, we look at the progress over the last 30 years or something, you can see that for the most part, we're heading in a pretty good direction. With a couple of exceptions, like environmental questions, for example, are, are very dire. But aside from that, things are actually looking relatively bright. I wouldn't say that the world is great, but it certainly sucks less than it did yesterday. Yesterday. And in spirit, very similar to what this book goes into, I can highly recommend you reading that easily in the top three of books I've ever read. I found a subreddit called Optimists Unite, which basically goes into these kind of things, posts memes and questions and articles and everything that has to do with stuff that is actually going good. So after we spent so many videos scrolling through facepalm and bad news and poopy people being phobic about all kind of things, Welcome to a little bit of optimism. So just sit back, relax, and feel your sweet butt grow. Mwah. Friends and family, oh, the world has gone to hell. Me, the world as 100 people over the last two centuries. Poverty just going straight into the dumpster. Basic education, yippee, we can read. Literacy, we can literally read. Democracy is also going up. My God, vaccination is just spiking. Look at that beautiful stuff. I mean, I hate needles, but I, I still see this as a positive, I would say. Child mortality is way down, which is a beautiful metric because child mortality, much like this beautiful beautiful book actually goes into, is very much a correlating factor with many other things. A reduced child mortality correlates with, for example, better medical care, it correlates with better economy, and it also correlates with better infrastructure. For example, open sewers and stuff, which are death traps for children, so when child mortality starts going down, it means that a nation is developing quite nicely. Every single country in the world today has a lower infant or child mortality rate than it had in 1950. Early in the 19th century, 12% of the world could read and write to dates 83%. Well, my dyslexia is certainly not making that statistic any favors. Anyway, the average American now retires at age 62. 100 years ago, the average American died at age 51. I'm guessing that statistic also includes like child mortality, which makes it a little bit skewed, but I can see the point. Over the last 20 years, the population of people living in extreme poverty has almost been cut in half. Yes, indeed, that is a beautiful statistic, isn't it? My God. Millennials are killing yet another industry. Disgusting. They're killing crime. Aw, heck yeah. Reported violent crime rates in the United States from 1990 to 2022 per 100,000 people of the population. So you can see it spiking here in 90s and then... Isn't that absolutely amazing. It's because we're too busy arguing on TikTok, so we don't have time to go outside and commit violent acts of murder. <laughs> okay, maybe that's not the analytical takeaway. <laughs> Scott has given away 16.5 billion from the fortune she came into after divorcing Amazon founder Jeff Bezos. Seems like a chill lady. The thing is, she is still very, very wealthy even after giving away 16 billion dollars. Billionaires could all do this and save millions of lives. And she donates right, in my honest opinion. I worked for some nonprofits, and lots of big donors would either start their own foundations or ask for a separate mini arm exist within the nonprofit to handle their donation specifically, which is obviously a huge money suck. Lots of other places and people, including state and local aid to help said population, comes with such crazy reporting and accounting requirements that often it would be better off not to take the money. So what does she do? If there is a place doing good work, she's just like, here a 30% upper for the next five years. It's not some immediate one-time shower of cash, no reporting or other requirements, truly no strings attached. That is beautiful. Isn't this kind of similar to what Keanu Reeves was doing when there was charities just receiving large donations and they're like, where's this even coming from? Like this, this is so weird. And they were like just fact checking it, I suppose. And it turns out that it was just Keanu Reeves just silently donating a crap load of money to charities he liked. That is so beautiful. With more people like that, Maybe there is a little bit of hope for the future, isn't it? Man, the world really sucks. And not in a good way. Or does it? With Keanu Reeves, it sucks in a good way. Okay, maybe that, maybe that didn't come out as intended. <laughs> Whoops. Don't let them divide and conquer. 
glorious comrade. Want to fight against Western neoliberal imperial hegemony? Oh, yes, indeed. Based Tradcon. Want to fight against Western multicultural degenerate globalism? No. Yeah, this is something to be careful with online. The online world does a few different things, right? I think it's three important factors to consider before you let yourself dive down too deep in any direction, really. Number one is that it's all very algorithm-fed. If you like one thing, you very easily end up in a bubble. Number two, the online world is more disagreeable than reality because you bump heads with people you would normally never bother interacting with, right? Which means that people that would probably not even bother each other are suddenly bumping heads for better or worse, but it definitely makes the world feel more argumentative than it is, perhaps. And number three, there are powers out there and people that will try to mess with opinions in certain countries, especially regarding election time and that kind of stuff. And there are a lot of bots on places like Twitter or Reddit and that kind of stuff. So like, uh, you know, don't take everything at face value. I suppose it's a good idea. Touching grass, unironically, is like a really good vaccine for for this kind of bogus. I should make like a book club thing. Maybe I should do it for the second channel. Let me know in the comments if you want a book club on the second channel. In the 1950s, there were three cars for every 10 Americans compared to nine cars for every 10 today. The home ownership rate was 55%, 66% today. And 6% of Americans had a college degree, 38% today. Oh my God, what changed? Once upon a time, you put jackets on women, a family could have a home and a car and send their uh, that cuts off, but send them to war, I guess, and jump the dad with knives when he comes home. <laughs> Yippee! I personally think that with, for example, housing and stuff like that, it is a bit ridiculously inflated nowadays because of demand. And in certain areas, you have like a rise of Airbnbs and people using houses as investment, which kind of like bumps the market, not only because people want a place to live. And I think people primarily compare it to like the 90s and early 2000s, not necessarily the 1950s, because houses were also way different. They were like, you know, a third of the size and you didn't have modern glass in the windows. You didn't have modern isolation. You had like asbestos in the basement, you know, so... So it, it's normal that the houses today would be a bit more expensive because they are much better. But uh, there is also like the discrepancy between how salaries have evolved, for example, and the cost of housing. So there are many ways to view this. But 1950 specifically wasn't like some utopia. Average square footage of a home was something like 1,000 square feet as well. Wait, 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 wait. How much is that? How much is that in not freedom units? Square feet to square meters. So it's like a little bit less than 10, so that would be like 92 square meters, 93 square meters to be exact. It's not super small, but for a full-scale house, it's pretty tiny, especially if you have eight brothers? My mom grew up in a 1,300 square feet house with eight brothers. Oh my god! I mean, nowadays, 90 square meters would be like a three or four room apartment. Imagine living in that with eight brothers, holy shit. So here's a little, little graphic that someone made, let's look into it, shall we? They could afford a house on a single income starter pack. Home ownership rates are higher today than 1960s, 1990. I think what people today, especially millennials and Gen Z, are frustrated about is like compared to the bump that was going up in 90s and 2000s, and then it went back down. So the market for housing is quite different than it was, for example, for our parents. So I think there is frustrations to be had about it, but I also don't think like the comparison to 1950, like some kind of utopia is particularly accurate either. Or maybe I'm just biased because, because I want to buy houses. <laughs> I just have to take some Raid Shadow Legends sponsors. <laughs> oh, God. Marriage rates are up and divorce rates are down, new data shows. Yeah, I was about to say, like, divorce rates are down would make sense if no one is getting married anymore. But if that one is up and the other one is down, that's pretty beautiful. In 2022, the divorce rate was 2.4 per 1,000 people. Although that isn't the lowest it has ever been, in 2021 it was 2.3. It continues a downward trend according to the data. So here we can see the graph, annual rate per 1,000 people, marriage has actually gone up. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense that it did a dip in 2020. I mean, pandemic stopped a lot of things. But a lot of people also waited with getting married after the pandemic, so I suppose, like, maybe this isn't proof of, like, a longer trend, but at least it didn't continue that massive steep after COVID, so... So that's pretty good. Support for gay marriage in the United States starting in 1970. And here we have the percentages. 0 to 2%. Then we have 2 to 10, 10 to 20, and so on, all the way up to 90 to 100. Okay, let's, let's play this little graphic, shall we? 1970, 75, 1980. Yeah, that's when all the punk rock bands started. Hell yeah. 85, 1990. Yeah, you can really see it changing now. You can really see it changing quite rapidly. 95. 2000. Yeah, now we're getting to like 
more more higher population rates. It's still like 50-50, you know, 2005, that's not even that long ago. 2010, 2015. So now you're getting to a point where a lot of places actually have a majority, but not not everywhere, not everywhere, which is like ridiculous when you think about it. When I look at a graphic like this, even here, like the final shot of it, it's like, yeah, this sucks, <laughs> honestly, but it sucks less than it did 20 years ago. So I am just hoping that in like 10 years or something from now, it's going to keep changing in the same direction. That That's what I would love to see, because even though it's gotten less crappy, it's still crap. I believe this is why we are seeing such a rise in heavily politicized transphobia. Not to be a drag on the optimist sub, but I feel like this has been a pretty targeted effort. Give a little to appease to people. You'll see a lot of traditional or religious conservatives are more okay with being gay now, but they hate and simply think about transgender people more than they ever have. Yeah, that has spiked a lot, especially in the last, like, I don't know, five to ten years. Go back 10 years and transgender policies were not the thing on the average person's mind. And now it's at the forefront of American political issues. One thing I've also noticed about this is that it seems to be the exact same song and dance as the antis did with the gay rights movement, you know, a few decades ago. It's the exact same talking points, the same like fake concerns and the poorly disguised hatred and like the weird things of getting involved with stuff that doesn't really have anything to do with you and just like trying to control other people. It's a bit wild. That's something I sometimes struggle to understand about people like that. Like, sure, some of them are grifters and just do it because, you know, it brings in clicks and stuff and ad revenue online. Like, that's understandable, still scummy, but understandable. There's a motive. But so many people I just look at and be like, you do realize what this is going to look like in like 10 or 20 years, right? You're going to look exactly like these black and white photos of people looking like absolute buffoons, you know, in the past. This is you. This, this is what you're going to look like in modern history. <laughs> oh my god. The number of oil spills per year has decreased by more than 90% since the 1970s. What's my source? Deep fried doge. <laughs> has it though? Has it though? How much have oil spills decreased since 1970? Have oil spills increased or decreased? In 2023, one oil spill was reported in which more than 700 metric tons of oil leaked. In the years since the 1970s, the number of oil tanker spills has been notably reduced from an excess of 20 large oil spills per year. Okay, so it seems to actually kind of add up. Hell yeah, deep fried doge. Bring me those oil tanker facts. Don't forget that the hole in the ozone layer is also healing and will no longer be of concern if we keep insisting on it. I'm sorry to break it to you, but they're not so sure that the ozone hole is still healing. I know this is more than a year old, but as of January 2023, the UN was convinced that it would heal itself by 2060. The ozone layer is slowly but surely healing, the UN says. I did a little bit of searching on this, and it seems like different sources are saying different things. Some sources are saying it's going to heal in the next 40 years, others are saying by the end of the century, others are saying maybe even in the beginning of the next century, but it seems like the consensus is that it's at least slowly healing. It's just like a bit uh, inconsistent with the pace. So this is actually like a good thing. This is something that has actually started progressing in the right direction. And even though it's slow, that feels pretty good. Positive change, time going up, up, up. Oh, no, 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 I'm gonna die! Oh, this is so funny. This is actually one of the fallacies in this book. It has like an entire chapter on it. How stuff in the moment feels really bad, but if you zoom out, it's it's not that big of a deal. Sort of doesn't mean that the problem in the moment isn't a problem that should be dealt with, but it's important not to feel like the entire world is ending because of it, right? It's sort of like that old saying where you say like you had a bad day, not a bad life. And I suppose that's pretty accurate when it comes to a lot of data as well r slash the way we were great grandparents home around the late 1800s early 1900s eventually seven kids all lived here with them oh look at that little cabin it's seven kids here at least to have the little horse moped that's very nice but seven kids oh my god i mean that sort of cabin is basically what we store lumber in on the countryside nowadays and they live there with seven kids holy shite the first log cab in my current town is on display. Yes, display at the local graveyard. Long story, haha. <laughs> and it is literally the size of your average backyard shed. Except it's like 400 years old. Again, literally. Less of an exaggerated but more relevant example. The house my mom grew up in was 1,400 square feet, two-story, four-bedroom, two bathrooms with a partially finished basement. Honestly, that sounds pretty nice. Like, 1,400, it's not the biggest thing ever, but like four bedrooms, you know, the rooms are a bit smaller. It sounds pretty cozy except she had seven brothers 
brothers and sisters. Oh, seven brothers. So, so they were eight siblings. Eight siblings. It was a tight squeeze. Yeah, eight siblings in four bedrooms. And I'm assuming one of the bedrooms is for the parents. So that's like three siblings per bedroom. Oh, my lord. One of America's youngest newsboys, four years old, Florida, 1913. Oh, he looks like a, like a happy boy. My three-year-old takes great pleasure in menial labor. Mother, I yearn for the mines, but we live in an urban area. How am I supposed to live without the thrill of manual labor? Ah, Minecraft. <laughs> if Minecraft has proven anything, it's that children yearn for the mines. Ah, bring back child labor in the coal mines. My data is Minecraft. 1913, god damn. This kid was a year out from the most horrific war that humans have ever experienced, in my opinion. He would have then lived through the deadliest influenza pandemic of all time, the Great Depression, the Second World War, and the Cold War, if he was able to survive all that anyway. What a life. Yeah, okay, that puts it into a little perspective. Yeah, I feel like, you know, when I was like locked inside recording meme videos and ordering takeout burgers during COVID, doesn't sound that bad in comparison, I'm gonna be honest. I mean, it always falls into that category where there can always be problems of different magnitude. Like, I had people around me, for example, pass away during the pandemic. That was very tragic and difficult to deal with. But I suppose it's also a positive to realize that we have better ways of dealing with everything from pandemics to sickness to healthcare to, you know, economic stability or just the comfort of the homes we're actually locked inside when stuff like this happens. Unless you count those videos of the celebrities that came out. What was it? They were singing like... Uh, Oh, we're all in this together or something like that on social media. They were like sitting in their like 10,000 square meter mansions and be like, yeah, you're living in a small city by yourself. Of course, you don't care about being locked inside. <laughs> that was pretty wild. <laughs> Thanks, I hate working so much. September 25th, 1926, Henry Ford announces the eight-hour, five-day work week. Duh! Everyone boo this man! Well, wasn't this actually a reduction in the average work time? Yes, which is what makes the situation so much more bizarre, assuming OOP is serious. Before this, it was pretty much eight to ten hours a day, six days a week, maybe even just literally Christmas and Easter and Fourth of July. We should keep it going and get to a four-day work week and make all business with over one million in profit pay for free bicycles for all employees yes oh my god that'd be absolutely amazing yes honestly six hour workday that'd be pretty poggers at least back when i worked in an office i kind of felt that you know if i just worked a bit more intensely i could easily get everything done in six hours you know there was not really a point to just drag it out and meetings are so inefficient man oh my god that's something i realized with the job i do now whenever i have a period with a lot of meetings for like you know company related stuff or like paperwork or finances or whatever it is Oh my god, it kills time. Meetings are awful. Recessions have become less frequent. The US has gone through 34 recessions since 1857. Recession and expansion, look at that. But it's getting less and less frequent and less and less dense. That is good. That is a sign of a healthy economy, I suppose. Even though the economy definitely has its quirks, uh, I suppose maybe it's more stable than in 1860 at least. The 27-year-old bloomer. He accepts his limits, doesn't let them stop him. You can do it, Anon! Unironically believes in heroes, wants to be one, doesn't smoke, drug-free. To further no problems, only minor setbacks, never abandons his brothers, understands sadness is just an emotion like others, and he is happy he can feel them. Let it go, Anon. Things are going to get better. No, he will make it. Knows we will all make it. He is the friend he wants to have. Isn't afraid to be wrong, learns from his errors. See the better world he wants to build, superimposed on the dark world around him. Wants to live in the countryside, works hard to get there. Okay, that one is probably like uh, a matter of preference, but the rest of the stuff is really, really positive. This feels like, you know, a puppy, but personified as a person. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Accepting your limits, but still not letting that stop you. Such a goated mindset with a banger quote, OP. And that quote with superheroes goes really well with it and its themes. Yeah, black and white Goku. <laughs> Ugh. Wow, he is literally me. I will strive to be like him. I want to be like Optimus Prime one day. What do you want to be when you grow up, Timmy? I want to be a car. I mean, it could be worse. A first human transplant of a genetically modified pig kidney performed. For the first time, surgeons have transplanted a kidney from a genetically modified pig into a living person. Doctors in Boston said Thursday. That is really cool. March 21st, 2024. This is really recent. It's so cool to see how much medicine 
is advancing. I hope eventually it reaches a point where we can just like grow organs and stuff, basically like plants, like fleshy plants. There is no animal connected to it. There is no donations needed. You just you just grow it like you would grow a fleshy plant and then you can just use it if you have problems with something in your body. That's really cool. What a bright future it could be. Fleshy plants. The world is going in the wrong direction. <laughs> Deaths from natural disasters is 25% of what it was 100 years ago. I put in the trash can. I mean, it's a funny meme, but this it's kind of a funny thing to put it on top. Just 7% of the world's population lived in a free or relatively free society in 1850. Today, that number is closer to two thirds. It's not that long ago since almost every single country in Europe was a monarchy. That's pretty wild. It's like a hundred years and a little bit, and like almost every single country in Europe was still a monarchy. That is wild. The time spent on laundry fell from 11.5 hours a week in 1920 to 1.5 hours in 2014. That is wild. I mean, it makes sense with laundry machines and stuff. I suppose we have similar things with dishes and that kind of thing. And also probably cleaning the house. You know, vacuum cleaners are pretty efficient. The world's nuclear stockpiles have been reduced by 85% since the Cold War. The violent crime rate has been on a downward trend since 1990 in the US. Just under 14.5 M crimes were reported in 1990. By 2016, that figure was well under 9.5 million. Over the last 20 years, the population of people living in extreme poverty has almost been cut in half. Yes, indeed! Thank you, SpongeBob, for your <laughs> trash pile of positive <laughs> statistics. We are growing more food on less land every year. So here is calories per acre versus time. And it's just like, zazoop. It basically goes up for everything. That is, that is incredibly nice and promising. Hell yeah. Bro, when the vertical farming people get their stuff sorted, this finna go crazy. I haven't heard of vertical farming. Would it be like Minecraft? <laughs> I love how everything goes back to Minecraft. Or are we talking about food growing sideways? Kinda both. Vertical farming is the practice of growing crops in vertically stacked layers. It often incorporates controlled environment agriculture, which aims to optimize plant growth and soilless farming techniques, such as hydroponics, aquaponics, and aeroponics. Look at this, that looks so fresh and nice. Hell yeah, just massive vertical salad farming. Me likey. Biomedical innovation is miraculous. Cystic fibrosis, once but all guaranteed an early death. A child born with CF in the 50s could expect to live until the age of 5. In the 70s, age 10. In the early 2000s, age 35. With Trikafta became a quantum leap. Today, those who begin taking the drug in early adolescence, a recent study projected can expect to survive until the age of 82.5, an essentially normal lifespan. That is so freaking cool. Hell yeah. A Tennessee pastor scaring the poo out of his congregants. Con con congregants? Congra congratulations. He's scaring the crap out of his congratulations. How have we done in the absence of God? It is remarkable to me. There are more people committing suicide right now in the United States than has ever been recorded in human history. We're getting divorced quicker than we ever have, if we're getting married at all. Uh-huh. We're more aggressive than we ever had. We're more aggressive than we ever had. There's more domestic abuse recorded right now than there ever has been. Uh. There ever has been. But we all say we want answers, but I think we want them if it validates what we already think. Oh my lord. That's a, that's a pretty funny edit, not gonna lie. <laughs> I think there is a fine line between realistic concern regarding serious subjects and fear-mongering. Like, none of these things we're talking about is stuff that should be ignored. And some issues have been more frequent recently. For example, mental health issues has been on the rise, especially during and after the pandemic. So there are problems that have occurred quite recently that maybe isn't the historical peak. I'm not an expert in that subject field specifically. But I suppose fear-mongering and talking about like, ooh, there has never been that much crime or anything, or even like the marriage point, even if it was true, I would probably argue it's partially because there are more options to live your life nowadays. We have more individual freedom, meaning that, you know, getting married and living a picket fence life isn't the only option to live your life. You have the freedom, and especially with the freedom that women have nowadays, like, you know, they can, for example, have a bank account on their own, which is a pretty key factor to living an independent life. 
you don't have to get married unless you want to. So even if you have statistics like that, that would be going down, or for example, divorce rates that go up, which could also probably be explained by just higher life expectancies, more people don't stay together forever when we live that long, they can be explained by other factors, which might even be a good indicator for other things. So like I said, there is a fine line between fear mongering and actually understanding statistics or the magnitude of problems, or if it even is a problem. Uh, so, so stuff like this just sounds like a <laughs> crappy TED talk. <laughs> Death rate from air pollution, 1990 to 2019 in the United States. Oh, hell yeah, that is so good. Glorious. Londres, 1976 versus 2021. Oh, that is so nice. Is that the London Eye? Is that where the London Eye is? I think I was there a bunch of years ago. From stupid parking lot to tree parking lot. Everyone should park more trees. How is it possible that the UK's emissions have declined so much? This is the main reason. The UK left coal behind. The UK CO2 emissions from coal are today lower than any point since 1800s. Look at that beautiful graph going down. Here in the UK, we love to hate on the government for not doing enough for climate change, but we have halved our emissions since 1990. Obviously, there is still far more to be done, but that's the largest purposeful decarbonization of any country in the world over that time period. The only countries with more are Eastern European ones whose industries collapsed post-1991. Only Denmark really comes close to that level of reduction. Not to mention the population has increased about 10 million or 20% since 1990. That is an impressive statistic. I would love to dig in to this kind of subject and see how much of it is like a net change or if it for example also has to do with how much business is moved abroad for example if you have less manufacturing in the uk itself does that mean the manufacturing is replaced with just other stuff outside in other places in the world statistics are tricky in that way you know you can always make them show a certain thing i have no doubt that there has been a positive change for sure but i'm also interested in digging into it more and see like exactly how it plays into with different factors oi english bruv ye shagging them emissions rotten i think i used that slang right thank you so much british people for complimenting me in the comments Optimists are smarter, doomer dunk. For some reason, people associate brooding personalities with intelligence. Doomers are thought to be smarter because they can obviously better understand the problems in the world. Horse power! <laughs> Optimists are smarter, live longer, and have more meaningful lives. I mean, in the next 20 years, are we gonna have like the optimist party versus the pessimist party? I mean, to be honest, can't get worse than what it is now, right? It's always a bit less bad than it was yesterday. Oh, yes. We see the problems around us, obviously, but are intelligent and confident enough to tackle them head on. The world has always been built by optimists. So here's a link to an article by SciPost. There has actually been research suggesting optimists are smarter. Optimist is associated with higher cognitive abilities. Study find. Published in the Journal of Personality and Individual Differences, researchers were interested in investigating the associations of dispositional optimism and pessimism with cognitive abilities in adulthood. They found that young adults with higher dispositional optimism and lower pessimism had higher reasoning skills and higher pessimism was related to lower scores on memory tests for middle-aged adults. I remember reading up on a similar thing a bunch of years ago. I'm not sure if I would tie it into cognitive things per se, but it's when you look at stuff like personality traits, which is always a little bit of like a, like a gray zone of science, you know. But there's a lot of different personality traits when you, for example, calculate how likely you are to do well in work life, for example. It's like how agreeable you are versus disagreeable you are as a person, for example. Do you like ask for more pay and stuff? Are you a bit pushy, uh, which typically makes you progress faster? Uh, there's also neuroticism. The more negative emotions or the more negatively you see things, the typically worse you do. And I guess it has to do with something that you exhaust your energy on seeing things in a negative, I suppose. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a super expert in the area either, but I do remember reading on that kind of stuff. That neuroticism is negatively correlated with career paths, I believe it was. Previous research shows that optimism is related to positive health and well-being outcomes, whereas pessimism is associated with health-related risks and maladaptive behaviors. I mean, I think we can just look at Twitter, and, and that, that pretty much confirms it, doesn't it? What a <laughs> hole.
According to intellectual investment theories, it is suggested that for personality traits can affect cognition abilities. For example, joy promotes creativity, and negative emotionality activates people's thought action speaking of intellectual abilities, to prepare them for quick decisions in threatening situations. People with optimistic views tend to pay attention to positive information and believe they are capable of influencing their lives. On the other hand, pessimists tend to believe life events are caused by external forces and their own influence is inferior. I can, I can kind of see that having a correlating factor, right? Even if you don't go into detail about how much of your life you can actually affect yourself versus how much is environment or the world, for example, if you believe you can change it, those things that does fall under your control, which probably depends a lot from person to person as well, would make you on average more likely to change your life for the positive. Whereas if you kind of sit down and say that this is just how the world is, you're more likely to affect things with my, which might fall under your own control. I think it's a very interesting nuanced subject. That might also be one I dive into in the future. That sounds really interesting. Shaking my head! All these kids just staring at a newspaper! Ah! Nobody socializes anymore! Look at these disgusting kids and their newspapers! I think this just goes to show that no one has ever been social on public transport. <laughs> we all just want to get to work and be done with our day, you know? <laughs> Extreme poverty is now eliminated in India. The World Poverty Clock Updates shows India's extreme poverty at less than 3%. This is one of the most significant global developments of our lifetime. That is amazing, March 2nd, 2024. This is also very recent. That is so cool. Malaria mortality rate of children in 2000 versus 2019. So here you see the map over the year 2000. You can see a definite spike of red areas in the middle and also on the coastlines. And here in 2019, you can see a stark decrease, especially in the most affected areas. That is very cool indeed. Decoupling countries that achieved economic growth while reducing CO2 emissions, 2005 to 19. Portugal, Spain, Ireland, Jamaica, Denmark, United Kingdom, Romania, Croatia, Finland, Netherlands, and the list goes on. Look at that. There is a little bit of positivity out there still, isn't it? Number of nuclear warheads worldwide from 1945 to 2023. And it spiked there in 85 on 63,000. And now it's like 12,000. But what about megatonnage? Which is actually a really good point. Like, what if we have fewer nukes, but they're just much bigger? First strike megaton by country. Estimated explosive power of nuclear weapons deliverable in first strikes. Looks like it's also gone down, which is really promising. That's a really good question, though. It's one of those questions that you should ask with statistics. Like, does this actually show the thing you think it shows, or is there more to it? Statistics is tricky that way. Global deaths in conflict since the year 1400 by Max. Roser. I suppose one aspect to consider is that there's also more people in the world, so there's more people that can also be harmed, you know. But especially in the last century, it's been a stark decline. You can see like how how the analysis just goes down towards the year 2000, which is uh, which is really nice. We shall be optimistic. We can still save the world. No, the world is doomed. Everything is messed up. We should be optimistic. We can still save the world. <laughs> Isn't well, that just beautiful, hell yeah? Man posing with picture of the forest he restored. This is actually really cool. I have seen this myself in person in a couple of places. I was traveling through the French countryside last summer, and I climbed like a hiking trail that went up a mountain with like old cool bunkers from the World War and stuff. And on the very top, there was a panorama picture of the same view, but from like a hundred years ago. And you could clearly see how many more trees there were. I'm gonna see if I can find the pictures. In that case, I'll ask Sam to pop them up on screen right now. It was uh, it was a pretty cool thing. It was pretty cool to see the change. Nostalgia cell, saying that the past years like the 50s and 80s was better Minorities, women, LGBTQ, and people who lived in dictatorships. I mean, if you want to experience sweet nostalgia, just get like a GameCube emulator. You know, you can play your old games, now in full HD, so they actually look the way you remember that they look. <laughs> Which is pretty nifty. People are so unhealthy nowadays. Meanwhile, in the past, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. <laughs> Here is one of the busiest men in town. While his door may say office hours, he actually on call 24 hours a day. The doctor is a scientist, a diplomat, and a friendly, sympathetic human being all in one, no matter how long and hard his schedule. And he smokes camel, camel cigarettes. Fun for the whole family, especially the kids. Life expectancy. The period life expectancy at birth in a given year. And it just completely starts going up in the last hundred years or so. That is absolutely beautiful. Look at that. By this progress, millennials will live until we're 300. 
<laughs> okay, maybe not. Share of people who believe in climate change and think it's a serious threat to humanity, 2023. And here you can see the graph, and it's like, yeah, most places, you know, it's kind of majority. It's still lower than it should be in a lot of places, but uh, it's getting there, slowly but surely. r slash optimists unite. Why are Reddit millennials so aggressively doomerish? I consider myself a political centrist. That being said, I find that conservatives are more prone to spreading misinformation. Leftists usually view the world through more rationalist lens, in my opinion, while conservatives take into account human behavior and spirituality more. I think parts of that is also very America-centrist, for example, the spirituality aspect. I think in other parts of the world, you don't necessarily have a tie with, for example, the conservatism and spirituality. That's very like the Christian part of the US that is kind of intertwined. It can vary a lot between countries, but but it sounds like this is written by someone in in the Merca uh, because of that small detail. Anyway, let's keep reading, shall we? The one area where Reddit leftists love to spread misinformation is economics. You could present any piece of data showing the economy is doing well and they would downvote you into oblivion. Literally every piece of data shows we are doing better than ever and yet Reddit leftists refuse to accept this. Take me as an example. I'm a 19 year old. I share a two bedroom apartment with my friend in Grand Forks, North Dakota. I pay 500 a month in rent and I will take the bus so my only other expense is food. I work full time at 19 hours at Target and I have money left over. Why do Redditors like to exaggerate how high the cost of living is? This probably sounds like a cop-out, but I genuinely think it's because of social media. Social media allows us to be more aware of other people's lives. But the result is that we usually hyper-focus on people who either have it very good or very bad. It's, it's one of the fallacies. It's good, good. Read book. Read book, good fallacy. I mean, bad fallacy, but good to read. <laughs> We correctly deduce that the conditions of the very well-off are only true for a relatively small percentage of the population, but we extrapolate the conditions of the very poor to all of society. I would explain why most people say they're doing well economically, but that the overall economy is doing poorly. We can acknowledge that we're doing well, or even that everyone else around us is doing well, but conclude that must mean that we're part of the highly privileged elite and that everyone else is starving in the streets. I think stuff like this is always incredibly nuanced, because you do have trends, for example, as salaries not keeping up with certain living costs, for example. But then, for example, if you look at some other historical data, when you look at how much of our disposable income we spend on, for example, groceries, it has typically gone down over the decades, even though we did see a spike during, for example, COVID and also when it was worse and that kind of stuff because gasoline price spiked. So there are there's always like a lot of nuance to these kind of things. And I think it very much depends on where you live, if it's in like an urban area, if it's further out, what kind of job you do, etc. So I think it's very important to not simplify things like this too much, because that's the danger I usually see with social media. Two things can be true at the same time. They just appear in different contexts for different people. And it's very important to say that these ones don't cancel out. They can both be true at the same time, and it doesn't mean that something isn't a problem or something shouldn't be considered. You know, nuance is very important, something that is often forgotten on social media because we have character limits on Twitter when we write arguments, which means that the arguments are pretty simple, aren't they? Well, laddies, lasses and lasses, I do hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed having you here. A little bit different, but I really wanted to do this for quite a while. And when I found this subreddit, I figured this was a perfect time to integrate one of my favorite books with a little bit of like fun knowledge and facts and highlighting that there are still problems in the world. But hopefully we are moving in the right direction. Acknowledging there are problems is good, but also not to be paralyzed by a very doomer mindset also means we can be more productive of solving it and actually take pride in the things that are getting better. With that said, I hope you have an amazing rest of your day, wonderful, beautiful bean, and I will see you in the very next video. Take care. Mwah.